Father, we do worship you this morning, and uh, we all come in here this morning and thankful that we can meet with you. We just bring everything we have, everything we're wrestling with, we're struggling with, we're wondering about, hoping for. Lord, we just bring it all to you this morning, God. We worship you. I pray that as we continue to worship you through the word of God this morning, that you would uh, speak through me that you would encourage people this morning, God, and that we may, that you would just meet with us to this morning, Jesus. God, we welcome you in this place. Holy Spirit, just meet with us. Speak to our hearts, Jesus. We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Taking this right here. Stay. Okay. How y'all doing this morning? Good, good. It's great to see everybody here this morning. I hope you've been having a great, great weekend. I'm super excited about tonight, the church fellowship slash baptism slash awesome time tonight at the, at the Lauder's house, our satellite location over at, uh, or just a few blocks away. So excited to be with you this morning. We're going to be talking about Jonah. Sir, you are familiar with Jonah especially if you grew up in vacation Bible school, and it's like one of those famous stories. But I love Jessica's prayer this morning because um, I was praying the same thing, that God, you would just give us fresh eyes to see this story in a way we may have never seen it before. And then he would just speak to us uh, this morning. So I remember a time in my life, I don't remember all the events that happened around it. I don't remember what got to this point. I just remember being at a point in my life when I just had enough. That was it. Again, I don't remember everything that happened, but the line was crossed, and that was it. Things needed to change. So at six years old, I told my parents, <laughs> took a while for you to get that hump. So I told my parents, this isn't going to work out like this anymore. I'm gone. I'm leaving. So I walk out the house, down the driveway. And those of you who know me, you're like, man, a lot happened in your life at six. But um, so I'm, I'm going down the driveway, and I got down the driveway hundreds of times. But somehow this day, it just seems so long to get down to the edge of the driveway. And as I'm walking down the driveway, going to be my own man kind of thing, and I'm turning around, I'm like, my parents aren't coming after me. <laughs> then, then now this is hurtful. So I remember I got to the, the, the point, it kind of seemed like all of a sudden I felt like lonely and a little scared, and I'm at the edge of the driveway, and I'm looking around, I'm like, you know, I didn't even have my big wheel, you know. Um, I just, you know, I don't know if this is a good idea. The timing's not right. So I decided to go back inside and let's work it out, you know, whatever. So I decided not to, not, not to run away. You ever, you ever did that before as a kid? Maybe your kids, you know, said they are going to do that before. You ever run from something or someone before? You know, we're all runners. We, we, we've all run from something or someone before. You ever been to those, those moments where, like, you ran from someone or something, and you kind of, like, got to a certain point, you're like, I don't even know how I got here. Like, what am I doing here? This wasn't on the map. You know, some of you might be, like, a geographical. They actually might, when you're driving, and you're like, I don't know, I've been there before. You're like, I don't even know where I'm at. You know, I, I mean, this was before GPS days, right? You know, you're like, I just, I, 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 mean, I didn't even know this place existed out here. And some of you maybe still like that with GPS, but um, you kind of get to a moment where you're like, I don't even know how I got here. You know, we all run for different reasons in our life and from different things. Sometimes it's, it's a relational situation that's happened in our life. Maybe it's through a marriage or it's through a friendship or family, something related to the job, and, and you've been hurt, you were rejected. Something happened, and you're like, the the line was crossed. So this person or these people, they're not going to treat me like this anymore. I'm gone. I'm going to leave. Sometimes it has to do with a relational situation or circumstance. Sometimes we run emotionally. You ever been there before? Where, you know, you're in the marriage, you're in the job, you're in the friendship, you're in church, and you're kind of going through the motions, and you're present, but you checked out a long time ago. You checked out emotionally, you checked out intellectually, you're there, but you're not really, really there. You know, sometimes 
we run, uh, maybe you're here and you're like, I don't even know about this God thing. I'm, uh, you know, you're still trying to figure out, but you've heard different things, you know, different YouTube videos, things that have happened in your life, circumstances in your life, and maybe you've been hurt by certain people, whatever, and uh, you know, you just like, you've never actually given God a chance because of some things that have happened in your life, and you've just been kind of running from him the whole, your whole life. There are many, many different reasons why we run. You ever run from God before? You know, it, similar situation, you know, maybe, it, it's interesting because a lot of times things happen in our life and we turn and we start blaming God for what happened, right? And so maybe you've been hurt, uh, something happened, God didn't come through for you, and you're like, he's not fair, and so you're like, I did this Christian thing, and so you just start kind of leaving and you start kind of just walking away because God did not come and come through for you in a particular situation. Why would God allow this to happen to me? Why would God allow this hurt to happen to me? This trial in my life. He seems to be coming through for other people, but not me. You know, sometimes it's just like the grass is greener on the other side. How about this? You know, maybe, you know, a lot of you know my story. 16, you know, actually it was a long time before that. But anyways, you know, by the way, you get a driver's license. It's almost like, you know, it's a driver's license. You get a license, but then it's a license to run away because I like, run from God. You're like, I'm free. You know, like you just start kind of, maybe that's some of your story. You kind of did a path in high school and through college and you got kids. You're like, I should go back to God, you know, now. But you kind of see that like, well, well, she looks pretty good. Well, he looks pretty good. Or this opportunity seems really good. And you kind of just want to go check it out. You want to see if you're missing out on something. And so you kind of got kind of run away from God in that way. We're all runners, and all of us have run from God at some point in our life. You may be running right now from something or from, from God this morning. You ever been in those situations, and you may be here this morning where you're like, things are happening, it's piling one thing after another, and, it, and, and it, maybe it's related to you running from God or not doing what God's called you to do, which is running from God, because if God told you what to do and you're not doing it, then you're running from God. But um, you know, you're just, all these things are happening, and, and it's piling up, and, and the weight is just crushing you, and it's so much for you to hold on to, but you're just, you don't know what else to do, and then you're late at night. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but it's, you're up at night, and you're sitting there wondering, and I don't know if this thing is going to work. I don't know if I can keep running, but you turn around, and you say, I don't see anything. I don't know how to get off of this highway, and you look forward, and you say, I don't see any exit ramp, and you just don't know what to do, and you just kind of feel hopeless, if you feel that way this morning, if you know someone in that situation this morning, I got great news for you, man. I got a message this morning. We have a message from God this morning to tell you that there is hope for you, that it's not over for you, that God still has a plan for you, that God still has a purpose for you. God's not finished with you, and there really is hope. Because here's the thing. You can run from God, but you can't outrun God. Amen? Now, some of you are like, that's a little, oh, like, I, I wish I could outrun him. You know, and some of you are like, I've been trying, but I, I didn't even know he was coming after me, you know? But you can run from God, but you can't outrun God. We're going to be taking a look at this powerful story with fresh eyes this morning. It's going to be coming sugar-free this morning. Um, but uh, we're going to be taking a look at this story and we're going to look at three things. We're going to see, number one, we're going to be taking a look at the description of a runner, what a runner looks like. We're going to be taking a description of runaway highway so that you know if you're on that highway or you know if you're going on that highway or you know someone's on that highway. And then the third thing is we're going to see, hey, there's an exit ramp. There's a way for you and I to get off of this highway. Amen? I'm so fired up about this, uh, about this story. So I want to give you a little bit of a background uh, to this story. Some of you have been, you know, you, you know the story. Maybe you can come up here and, and preach it. But, but so for those of us that are still trying to, you know, figure out the Bible and everything, I just want to kind of give a little bit of a context to understand where we are in this story of Jonah. So the Bible, it's 66 books. It was actually different, 66 different uh, books all put together in one Bible. And so it's a story of God's redemptive plan for the world. That's what the Bible is. And uh, it reveals God, it reveals his plan, it reveals his purposes. And so in this story, we see that um, it, very close to the beginning, he chooses a guy named Abram who became Abraham. And he chooses him, he says, hey, I'm going to build a nation through you, and, and, and through you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a group of people, and these people are going to be a vehicle that are going to bring about my purposes and my redemptive plan to this world. 
So that happened. That actually happened. So he tells Abraham, look up at the skies, Father Abraham, look up at the, at the skies, and you can, the, the, is, is the stars are numerous, as the stars are, that's going to be your descendants. And God actually did that, and that's why when you look on a map and you see the news, there's a, state, there's a nation of Israel. That's where Israel came from. So he builds, he builds this nation, and he's, um, um, some of you, I never knew that. No, but, um, so he builds this nation, and, uh, and he's trying to get them to do what he's called them to do. And just like you and I, they fail a lot. They start following God, and then they stop following God. They get, they get seduced by these other nations, and they start kind of worshiping these other gods. And so what God does is God gives them these people called prophets, prophets, you know, they didn't have the Bible written yet, so they actually are the Bible in the Old Testament. So, I mean, they're not the Bible, but you know what I'm saying. Like, so they're, they're living the story. So, uh, but he gives them prophets, and these prophets were chosen by God, set apart by God to be the voice of God. So these people are to speak the will of God to God's nation so they know what to do. So, he's, you know, these prophets would explain to them, you know, God's purpose, God's plan, the direction they're supposed to go, um, what they shouldn't do, what they should do, all this kind of stuff. And so these were, are, are the prophets. And when you, again, if you look at your Bible and you see all these different names, Hosea, Joel, Obadiah, who Obi-Wan Kenobi was named after, I'm not really sure, but um, Amos, you see all these different people, those are prophets. And when you look at those letters, those letters are about the message that God had for his people in that particular time, in that particular, those circumstances. One of these prophets was Jonah, our gold medal cross-country runner. This guy was the best runner in the Bible, took the gold by, uh, long, by, by, by far. So <clears throat> a little bit about Jonah real quick. Jonah uh, was a prophet, obviously. Um, he's mentioned in 2 Kings 14, 25. For those of you who want a little bit of information, he, he prophesied to a king in that particular time. But Jonah, a prophet, gets an assignment from God. God comes to him. He's going to speak the word of God. Well, God's word comes to him and gives him an assignment. And he goes, the assignment is to go give a message to a group of people who were brutal you just Google the Syrians. That's all I'm telling you. Okay, ISIS, Taliban, the little elementary people towards these people. These people were vicious, horrible things to people they captured. Don't Google right now, but just you can go if you want to. You're just, I want to know. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are bad, bad people. Brutal nation. Enemies of Israel. And God says, I want you to go give a message to these people. And Jonah's like, I don't like that idea. I don't want to do that. You ever been like that before? Maybe God's called you to, 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 to uh, talk to, minister, or, or to be with someone that you, would, that you have a, a rift with, that you got issues with. I mean, Jonah didn't want anything to do with this. He's like, I'm not going, I'm not going over this. So he, what God actually called him to do is to go to this, this city called Nineveh, which is, was in um, Syria. He's not afraid. Even though these are like the Taliban, ISIS um, of the day, he's not afraid of these people. He doesn't want to do what God called him to do. He thinks God should bring judgment. He thinks God should punish these people. Because he knows if he goes and gives this message that these people might repent, that these might, people might turn to God, and these people might get the mercy of God. He doesn't want them to have the mercy of God. You ever felt, you ever been in a situation where you don't want someone to have the mercy of God? Like, I'm, being, I'm being serious. Like, we're looking at the story right now. Think about the most horrific person in your life or a group of people in your life, and God tell them, you go tell them and try to bring salvation to those people. And you're like, I don't want to do that. He doesn't think God's making a good move. Bad publicity for him. This is the only um, prophet who God actually called to go speak to another nation other than Israel. So Jonah's got a problem. I, I, I don't want to do what you're telling me to do. This guy was chosen by God, set apart by God. He's the voice of God, and he just runs. And in all the prophets, he's the only, uh, his book is the only book where we actually have a story about Jonah, not necessarily the message. About all the other stories of prophets, they're about the message. Jo Jonah, it's about him. And when you and I look at this story, it's about us. This is like a mirror when you're looking into the scripture, this story. And you see you see us in this story, and we see God. So what does a runner look like? 
What does a runaway highway look like? And how can we take that exit ramp? Well, let's take a look at chapter 1 of Jonah, and let's see uh, what's going on here. Jonah, I'm going to read through the whole story, and then I'm going to go back and then basically mention some points um, about the runner and runaway highway, and then we'll talk about this exit ramp. So let me go and read the whole story. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of, of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, and that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners, not Seattle mariners, but the mariners uh, were afraid and each carried out to his, cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid, lain down and was fast asleep. So the, Jonah, uh, so the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Which translates like, What are you doing? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. It's not a good day for Jonah right now. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country? And what of, people, what, what, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Oh, yeah, by the way, the sea, the, all the, you're in the middle of the storm. The one that made that is God, my God. Um, and he, and um, the men, then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? Let's talk about a moment right there. What should you do? Um, for the sea grew more and more tempest, tempestuous. And he said to them, pick up, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. And I know it is because of me that this great tempest has gone upon you, has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to go back, to get back to the dry land. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempest, temptuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood for you. O Lord, have you done as it is pleased, as, as it pleased you? So they picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea, and the sea seized from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Wow. That's, that's intense. That's intense. I'm not sure if that was on Jonah's gay plan. This is, this is what I'm going to do, Right? So I'm going to uh, explain to you four descriptions. We're going to talk about what a runner does and a description of runaway highway. The first thing is this. Running from God is a heart issue, not just a theological issue. Running from God is, not, is a heart issue, not just a theological Look at, um, issue. Look at verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Now, in, in, that, that word, uh, presence of the Lord, that phrase, in the Hebrew, it's literally saying that he's running away from actually serving God, the call that God has on his life, and he's running from that. And, you know, if, if we had a map in here, so, you know, where, where Jonah is, and he's got to go to uh, Nineveh, that's about 550 miles, so if I turn around and look this way, right, Nineveh's over here, and then uh, Tarshish is about 2,500 miles that way, and it's the kind of end of Spain is where it was. And he's got to go through the sea. And it was kind of like the ends of the earth, like the very farthest play. So Jonah wants to go as far as way as he can from God. Isn't that what we do a lot of times when we're trying to run from God? We try to change environments. I'm not going to church. Yeah, you know, I'm staying away from those people. We often try to change environments when we're running from God. And he wants to go as far as he can from God. Now, this guy's a prophet. You're like, do you really think that you can outrun God? 
I mean, do you really think you can do it? Like you, I mean, God chosen you. He's spoken through you. You've seen him do the things that he told you to say, to, the, the things you prophesied you've seen actually God do. Do you really think you can outrun him? I don't think that Jonah thinks he can outrun him, but he wants to try to get as far as ways he can that maybe he can't hear the voice of God. Maybe he can sear his conscience. Maybe God would just forget about him. You ever been there, been there before? I just got to go as far as I can from God. Now, as I mentioned, this is a heart issue, not just a theological issue. Now, later on in the book, I'm going to give you a little teaser, okay, for later on. But at the end of uh, Jonah, chapter 4, verse 2, he says this, after he's gone to Nineveh. He says, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Listen, Jonah knows God. He knew God. It, it, this wasn't just, you know, I mean, he didn't agree with God. He, he didn't think God, that was a good idea for God to do. He didn't want God to do it. But, but, but he knows God. As a matter of fact, what he says about the character of God is actually related to Exodus 33, 34, when uh, God, uh, uh, the, the glory of God flown over Moses. Those of you Bible scholars know what I'm talking about. And he, and he said, I, the Lord, and he, he begins to give a description of who he is. That's almost verbatim of, of what God says from Exodus. Listen, Jonah knows the Bible. He knows the, God, the word of God. He knows God. This wasn't just like, oh, I, I think God's okay with it. He can, he's gonna, I, I got a sabbatical. I'm gonna take some time off. He's totally good with that. He knows the character of God. Listen, running from God is, not, is, is a heart issue, not just a theological issue. You, you, ever, you ever been in a situation before where you know people um, that, that, that were following God and they just, um, they start make, making rational arguments to justify their decisions? Maybe you've done that or you know people that do that. You see, often what times is when we're following God and our behavior begins to change and, and we, don't, we start to do things that we know are against the, the will of God, we start to, to start thinking things and we're like, well, this is, this is not consistent with what God's word is, but I want to stop doing what I'm doing. So I'm just going to say I'm going to stop believing what I believe so that I don't have to feel guilty anymore and I can just run free happens all the time i've done it see people do it all the time and people come up with all these reasons i, mean, I had a guy one time come to me and he's like hey can i meet with you at your house because i want to talk about like he was going to bring all these rational arguments about god and and and, and write it you know why, why you know try to get me to convince him i guess that, that god was real and that he existed and, and he showed up at my house and he goes man i, I felt like god just talked to me I, he goes i just realized like it has nothing to do with that it's just about me submitting to god and i was like that's right. What else you need? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I didn't say anything to him. You know, he just showed up like God just, just worked in his life, you know. But oftentimes, people will use rational arguments to try to say why they don't believe in God. But a lot of it has to do with their behavior. They don't want to stop what they're doing with their behavior. And maybe something, again, has happened in your life and you're mad at God. My family and I watched a movie called God's Not Dead Friday night. Anybody seen that um, before? He's not dead. So the movie is about um, a freshman student in a college, and he goes to college, and the professor, I guess, I don't remember what top subject it was, maybe philosophy, but uh, the professor wants everybody to sign this piece of work, uh, paper that's saying that God is dead. And this one guy says, um, I'm not doing it. So then he gets in this debate with this professor, and, his, and then they, they turn, literally debate, like, you know, he presents his case, and, and the class is the jury, I guess, and so the whole movie's about this whole thing that's going on. <clears throat> Now, the professor, as the movie goes on, and he's so antagonistic towards Christians. I mean, it's like this guy's ruthless about trying to uh, convince people that God's dead. I mean, he's got Stephen Hawkins, all these, you know, all these great things. But you realize, but when he was 12, he prayed, his mom was sick, he was a Christian, his mom was sick, and he prayed and asked God to heal her, and he didn't heal her, and he's mad at God. So they have this little debate, and at the end of the, the, the debate, <clears throat> the, the guy, who, the, the student who's a freshman, he goes up to him and he says, why do you hate God? He said a lot better than I just did, you know, but it's almost like, the, you know, a few good men moment. He's like, why do you hate God? And the professor responds, because he took everything from me. This guy's up trying to lead people astray, deceive people, and the whole root issue is he's got a problem with God. 
That's probably you. What's your beef with God this morning? You got a beef with him? How's your heart? Where are you at? When a professor says that, student responds, how can you hate someone that does not even exist? Oh, mic drop. People that run from God, it's a heart issue, not just a theological issue. And and, and maybe you're here this morning and and you're still kind of trying to figure out the whole God thing. You're trying to figure out if God is real. You know, is God not dead, you know? And, um, but I I ask of you this morning, if you are sincerely wanting to know God is real, what's holding you back? Why would you not want the claims of Jesus, the claims of of the Bible, the claims of this story, the transformation that you've seen in people's lives? Why would you not want to know that? I I would like to figure that out. I'd like to explore that a little bit. And and if you're not willing to that, I'm I'm just trying to get the heart issue, no pun intended. But if you're not willing to do that, there's probably a heart issue going on. Not a theological issue. Running from God is a heart issue, not just a theological issue. That's a description um, of a runner. Here's the second description of runaway highway. Running from God is a downward spiral. Is a downward spiral. Let's look at verses 3 through 5. It's going to be up there, but I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, I, in my notes, I'm just going to point out um, the scripture I believe is going to come up there, but I'm just going to read it out um, to you. The author repeats the word down. Down, 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 right? So um, I just feel like I should do that. I don't know. Um, he goes down to Joppa, down to a ship, down to the inner part, down to sleep. And as we'll see next week, he ends up going down into the belly of a fish and down to the depths of the sea. That's the, the, the runaway highway is a, is a downward spiral. And you're heading straight into a storm. Isn't that true? I'm, so many of you could probably get up here and give testimony after testimony of the truth of that in our life. It is a downward spiral. You know, we made comments like, it's just one decision. It's not like I'm going crazy. I'm not hitting the cray button or something. It's just one drink. One book. One look. One compromise. Just one dinner. One conversation. One night. One time. I'm just going to Joppa. It's not like I'm going to end up in the middle of a, sea, a fish belly. I'm just hanging out in Joppa right now how it starts it's a slippery slippery the farther we run from god the farther down we'll go no one wakes up and says i want to become a drug addict like during the school counselor's office and like who do you want to be you're like i don't know engineer i don't know i want to be a lawyer i want to be a doctor i want to be a drug addict that's what i want to be like nobody signs up for that you just one thing after another just goes and goes and goes it's a downward spiral. Well, I look at verse 3. It says in here that he went to down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And in the original language, what's going on here is it's, it, it, it's that he found something that seems to be a promise of a successful flight from God. You ever been now before you're running from God, all of a sudden you're like, wow, this opportunity. Like, like you know, I, I, I'm trying to, to you know, um, you know, I guess an example of that, you know, you know, I was in high school, and it's like I'm trying to pursue this, this lifestyle, and, and all these opportunities are coming. You're like, oh, man, this is, like, amazing. You know, it, it's interesting, you know, how much you all of a sudden find these things that kind of help you in your flight from God. Well, it must be God's will, <laughs> you know? It must be God's will. So it's, it's, it's uh, running from God. It's a hard issue. Not just theological, it's a downward spire. And here's number three. Running from God brings consequences for you and those around you. Hello? Running from God brings consequences for you and those around you. I talk to people all the time and they think it's not impacting so and so. Yes, it is. Our sin and our decisions impact people 100% of the time. 100%. Look at verse 4. 
But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship threatened to break up. I mean, the, the ship's now like going to break up. And then the mariners were afraid, and they cried out to their gods. They hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Listen, th- these guys are, are, are people that are transporting goods. This is some cash money that they're just throwing over the, the boat. There, there's a cost now involved. Not only are they in the middle of a storm, but now they're losing money because of Jonah. <clears throat> there's a cost to following Jesus, but there's a greater cost in not following Jesus. There's a greater cost, and it will cost other people, our family, our friendships. And then, you know, you see in verse 13 that these guys, these guys are some pretty good guys. The manners, you know, like, I'd like to be in a ship with them. Maybe, I don't know. But, like, they're, they're trying to help Jonah out, so they're going to try to row to, to, the, to the land, right? And, and they find themselves going up against God. But they're trying to help him out. They don't want to throw him overboard. So but, but God's like, he, he turns up the heat. He turns up the storm. And I'm going to get here in a minute. But listen, God will turn up the heat in our life. He will. So these guys, I mean, you got all of a sudden these, these people that are, um, you know, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to help out. But it, there are consequences for you and those around you. I remember when I started out at Houston Community College right after high school, and I was not in an academic pursuit yet. And I dropped out and moved to um, San Marcos and went to, uh, I had friends going to Texas State. Well, it's called Texas State now. Back then it was called Southwest. I don't even remember. San Marcos. So, um, and I just lived up there in the dorm room. Didn't have a job. Just partying. That, like the, one of the first days there, a friend of mine found a girl's ID. Because, dude, I found it. I go, let me see that thing. I ate lunch, breakfast, dinner with that ID in the cafeteria. Talk about uh, you're, in jo- you're like, oh, there happens to be a ship. Dude, I got an ID. I can, I can eat up here. I got caught, I busted, busted a couple of times, but I said it was my girlfriend. Uh, anyway, so, um, but I had my truck, and my parents were like, we're coming to get your truck. Because the title's in our name. You're not doing that. You're not, you're not taking that. So they, they drive up to San Marcos. My parents drive up. You know, three hours, three and a half hours. They go to a restaurant. They got some friends with them, and they're like, we want your truck back. So I go, and I meet him at the restaurant, give him the keys, and I just leave. I was so selfish. But it cost my parents so much. What I put my parents through, that was just a, snippet of what they had to do when I was going through all that. Don't fool yourself and think that you're not impacting other people. There are consequences for you and those around you. Last point real quick. Uh, last description. Well, this is, we're going to land here hard on this. Running from God is no match for the relentless grace of God. Amen? Running from God is no match for the relentless grace of God. Notice that Jonah, <clears throat> he can never get away from God. <clears throat> As you go through the story, here's, here's where God is. He caused the storm. He caused the captain to pursue Jonah. He caused the lots to fall um, uh, on, uh, towards Jonah. He turns up the storm. He provides a rescue for Jonah. God is pursuing Jonah. And you think, I mean, stop and just think about this. Like, what are you doing, God? You're God. What do you, why, why would you have anything to do with someone that, that just gives you the Heisman and doesn't want anything to do with you? I, mean, I think God has some pretty, a lot of things going on that day. You know, I don't know all what was happening, but, but I mean, he, I think he had some pretty important things to do. Why are you wasting your time with this person? You, you could get somebody to, to go in there to Nineveh to speak it. Why Jonah? What are you trying to do? But God pursues him. He comes after him. And God is causing all of these circumstances. I mean, just think about it. Do you think about how the love of God and the mercy and the grace of God, that God would go through that extent 
to get someone's attention, to put other people in harm's way to get someone's attention, to provide a fish to be able to save him in the sea to get his attention. You don't think that God's going to go through the great lengths because he loves you and wants you and is calling you to come back, to come back home? You don't think the, the great lengths that he went through when sending his son Jesus Christ to come and to pay for your sin because we deserve the wrath of God, the justice of God, we deserve to be punished, and God gave his son Jesus Christ to die in our place? You wonder about the love of God and the grace of God? You're no match. You're no match for his grace. It's a relentless grace. You know, I was kept thinking about the movie Rocky IV when I was going through this, and uh, Rocky's going to go fight Drago, the Russian and I remember his wife was in there before he goes. She's like, you can't win. Of course, the illustration breaks down here because he did go to Russia train and be the Russian. But, um, but listen, you can't win. If you're running from God, I just want to tell you, what are you doing? You can't win. And it's not about a punishment. It's about the grace of God. I'll never forget July 17, 1997, running from so long for so many years and coming into the uh, pastor's office and crying out to God and just the mercy and the grace of God. I talk about it all the time because it's a, it was unreal. I'll never forget it. God's grace is relentless. When you run from God, you're no match for his grace. Let me give you, um, uh, oh yeah, I gotta tell you the story. I mean, <clears throat> when I was in college, you know, still on, on my runaway highway, and I went to the Texas and Oklahoma game that was in Dallas. And Tyler Chespin, y'all know Tyler, you know, was an elder here. They're living College Station. He went to University of Texas. I'm trying, trying to figure out that thing now. <clears throat> but, um, uh, you know, we, we went to high school together, and we and another friend, my, uh, Mike, and another guy, we went to, uh, to Dallas to go to the Texas OU game. I was at A&M, but I just want to go hang out, go party or whatever. So we were staying at Tyler's brother's apartment. Now, just before this was happening, I was at a low point, and I was wrestling, and I was kind of struggling through things. And I talked to my mom, and I was trying to talk to my mom about what's going on, because you always call your mom when you're, when you're trying to go through stuff. And, you know, she's praying with me, and I pulled out my old Bible as a kid. It's the old King James Version. So I open it up, and I don't even know what the, I'm just reading. I'm like, man, <laughs> I couldn't understand, you know, thee thou, you know. And so, but I was trying, I was trying, you know. And I remember um, her praying, and then, like, that next day, I think, is when we went up to Dallas. And we happened to stay at Tyler's brother's apartment, who I believe at that time is a Christian, and his roommate's a Christian in seminary. So we're, um, we're there that night, and we go out that night. <clears throat> I'm sure studying somewhere. So, and there are people out on the street sharing Christ with people. Like, call, I don't know if they're in seminary or not. But I remember this, I'll never, this guy went and came up to me and goes, Hey, man, Jesus Christ loves you. And he looked at me and goes, You don't know, man. God might have planned for you. God might want you to be a youth pastor one day. And I'm, tell, I'm telling you, it was like this guy's just looking at me. And I just, I, I'm not going to tell I just said some encouraging things to him to leave me alone. And um, uh, I go back to my apartment that night, or th to Tyler's apartment that night. You know, we made it back. And um, I didn't have a ticket to the game, so they go to the game. And I'm standing there, and I'm in the apartment with Tyler's brother's roommate, who's in seminary. And I just start opening up to him about what's going on. And he prays for me. He goes, you want to pray? And I didn't pray. I ain't praying. Man, God was after me. And he's after you because he loves you. He loves you. I didn't go to Tarshish, but I came back and got in a fraternity. So it took a while. Um, and I can't because of my life that has happened ever since then. You know, you go, I don't know. But I tell you what, I wish I would have responded to God at that moment. Maybe you're at that moment. Let me give you three things about the sex of rampant. We'll get out of here. This is storm of correction, by the way. Uh, if y'all remember about a month ago, I'm sure you do. It's probably on your refrigerator. But we talked about the story when Jesus sent the disciples into the storm. And it was like a storm of perfection where God's taking you through a trial to, to, to become, make you more holy, make you more like him, to trust him. Well, then there's a storm of correction. Well, this is a storm of correction that, that, that he's in. Um, let me give you three things. Number first, what do you do? What do you, how do you get on the exit ramp? Number first thing, you need to wake up. You need to wake up. 
Jonah's at the bottom, and what is the captain going there? He says, wake up! Get up! Call on your God! What's funny is, that, is in the language, the, the Hebrew language, it's very similar to the initial call of God. It said, arise and go to Nineveh. And now the captain's preaching to Jonah. Right? He's talking to him in the apartment there. But you got to wake up. Wake up and see your, look at the reality. It's so hard for us to see reality. And listen, I have been in situations, you know, you know just, I mean, the guilt and the shame I can't, is unbearable. And I tried to figure out on my own how to do things and how to try to make it work. But I, I finally had to come to a point like, I can't do it on my own. And you got to wake up, you got to realize you can't do it on your own. Wake up and see God's purpose in your life. you got to wake up and see the reality of the situation that you're in. You're in the middle of a storm. we got to wake up. The second thing um, that we got to do is we got to own up. we got to own up. you got to own up. You know, I, and I wrote this down, and I don't have it in my notes, but it's, uh, it's in the Bible. Um, it says, those that conceal their sin, I'm paraphrasing this, but those that conceal their sin, they, they, they don't get the mercy of God. You got to own up to where you're at. And that's hard. And it's scary sometimes. But that's the exit ramp. There's not another one. You got to wake up and you got to own up to what you've done and where you're at. The last thing is this, you got to give up. Now Jonah gives up, and I wouldn't say this is like, you know, positive kind of give up thing. I mean, he tells the guys, throw me in the sea. But by the way, the sea just, the rage just completely stopped. But he wasn't really sacrificing himself. Like, I mean, he really wanted to just die. Like, I'll just die in the ocean. That's how bad he didn't want to go to Nineveh. But we got to give up, man. We got to surrender. And you know what that looks like for sometimes? That means you got to go public with some people. That means you got to go to some people. And you got to tell them what's going on. You have no idea. You have no idea the grace that God has waiting for you. When you're willing to do that, it's overwhelming. But you got to give up. You got to wake up. You got to own up. You got to give up. That's the exit ramp. There's no other one. Where are you at this morning? You on the runaway highway? Maybe you're just at Joppa. You're not on the ship yet. You could turn and take the exit ramp. And right now, if you're thinking about that exit ramp, the enemy is trying to tell you all the reasons why not to do it. But grace is waiting. And it's grace that you're here this morning. It is 100% grace that you're here in this message. Oliver's going to play a song and, and Megan is going to play a song. And let's just um, you have a time of response. Uh, Quentin and Alicia will be up here and I'll be up here. And, and let's just respond to God, what God's doing in your heart, in, in your life. Maybe you just want prayer about something. You can come up and ask for, ask for prayer. If uh, you uh, want to make a decision to trust Christ, you want to get off, get on the exit ramp and get off the highway, wherever it may be, let's not let this moment go by. It was about two to three years later that I responded to God after that weekend in Dallas. Don't make that your story. If you want to just sit in your seat and pray, you can do that. You want to stand and sing, whatever. Let's just have this moment with God.